Welcome to section 3, home to the near nasties and haunt of the tortured, toasted, witchiest witches there ever were. This episode, we enter a haunted house with the damned are getting their revenge just a few generations too late. Ghosts and posh Brits come face to face in a showdown of supernatural murder as we revisit Norman J. Warren in one of his multiple section 3 entries. Terror. A medieval curse haunts a family. It's a curse that was put upon him by a witch, their ancestors hunted down and burnt at the stake, only for her to get her bloody revenge. Cut to modern day Britain, and during a party hosted by James Garrick, the descendant of the rich family who conducted the burning, Anne, James's sister, is apparently hypnotised and attacks James with an ornamental sword that was said to have been the weapon that was used against his ancestors. The curse, it seems, is back, and bloody havoc is being wreaked upon the guests of the party as one by one they face a gruesome death at the hands of the mysterious and powerful killer. What about that little incident with Anne and the sword? Why on earth should they be interested in that? And doesn't it interest you? First that happens, then we find Carol's body. Jesus, do you know what you're saying? I'm gonna have to talk to her. James, what's the matter with you? Why on earth should she want to kill Carol? Well, why on earth should she want to kill me? No reason at all. Unless they're really... Oh, is. Christ, you're not going to start that again. Check the records, Philip, like I did. You'll find that nearly everyone who became involved in that house died violently. What about your dear old dad? I thought he died peacefully in bed. Peacefully? You didn't see his face. His eyes. Wide open and staring. It was heart failure, James. Heart failure, nothing else. All right. What made it fail? Terror by Norman J. Warren is an example of British horror that dabbles with the continental feel. Carrying overtones of Argento's supernatural films, it's certainly an adventurous movie that favours imagery over narrative coherence. Beginning a little groan inducingly with a sequence that serves as exposition for the situation, we find ourselves in medieval England in the midst of a witch hunt. A literal witch hunt at that. The witch is captured, tied to a stake and burnt to death, but she returns to get her revenge and places a curse upon the family that she's apparently been tormenting. Evoking Satan just before she burns, the witch is able to get her revenge and the family members die horrific deaths at her hands. <laughs> Serves the master. No earthly thing may take that right and live. Life is hereby forfeited. And every male and female of your line is damned. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just a movie, though it's a movie based on the family history of the Garricks, a family with royal heritage. Well, I guess I had no right to expect elegance, despite the presence of Glynis Barber. It's a clunky start, and it proves to be a clunky film, but that's not the end of the story, thankfully. Like I say, Terror is a film that is uncommon in the British horror camp, having as it does its feet in both a very British feel and a continental feel. Much like many of the Italian supernatural films, it boasts a visual style that really leaps off the screen. Comparisons have been made to Suspiria, for instance, because of the use of colour, and several of Argento's motifs are employed here, including mysterious unseen killers, aggressive knife action, and some rather squirm-inducing use of glass. But Argento isn't the only apparent inspiration here, though the feel is certainly Italian and terror is unusually aggressive in its violence for a British film. It also leans more towards a feeling of being out of control. There's a nonsensical dreamlike quality to it, where not everything makes sense, but at the same time, it all seems acceptable. In short, it's not a film that stands close scrutiny because, like dreams, it simply seems incoherent and absurd if you do. And it has to be said, the movie doesn't make much sense. Why do most of the victims become victims when they weren't anything to do with the family other than being acquaintances? Isn't the witch just after the family themselves? Are these folks that the ghost is killing simply a way for them to pass the time? 
I can think of several ways of making them in some way involved in the curse. For instance, they could have been the descendants of the villagers that uh, burnt the witch, had there been a little change in the screenplay. Or it could have been that the movie that they saw could have somehow passed on the curse. That worked well enough in Demons, didn't it? But no, collateral damage is the order of the day as the curse just goes after everybody at the party. It's far from all bad though as bloody deaths are handed out from the last house on the left like death of Glyn Sparber, who frankly is so gorgeous she could have been kept in the film a lot longer, to the profondo rosso like decapitation of Philip. And that one is toe curlingly uncomfortable. There is something about glass cuts that is just terribly uncomfortable to witness. A rum? Yes, thank you. Are you doomed as well, Anne? No, it's only direct descendants. He's the one. Well, you've only got to look at him, see he's doomed. <laughs> I don't know. This house makes me feel a bit funny. Yeah, I know what you mean, love. It's giving me a strange feeling as well. So that's what caused it. Don't jest, love. You know all about my strange power, don't you? Do I? Yes. Oh, God. The British feel is certainly not lost, though. In fact, the film is rather split in its personality between the Italian flair for operatic levels of violence and the British soap opera feel. Amusingly, there is a scene that opens up with a shot of detergent evoking the fear that we may be about to be held into commercial. It's a funny and suggestive moment. Maybe it's a visual gag about removing bloodstains, a common concern in the washing powder commercials of the time. Maybe it's a nod towards kitchen sink dramas that were also popular at the time. Either way, it's an amusing moment of playfulness in the film, and it's not an isolated moment either. Terror turns itself to comedy on plenty of occasions, including some self-referential nods to Warren's early career in soft sex movies. In what works out to be a rather protracted joke, the production of Bath Time with Brenda is marred by interruptions, incompetent acting, and the director at his wit's end with a ditzy actress who seems to think that she's making art rather than a cheap stag movie. It's an image that would sit quite happily in a carry-on movie, with its bawdy cheekiness, and if it doesn't seem enough of a joke in its own right, Warren later takes us to a sex club, where this is going on. Is that Marilyn Manson? No, it's not Marilyn Manson, but talk about contrast and compare. A commentary on the British sex industry would seem a bit out of place in a supernatural horror film, but if it wasn't for the fact that this film is already a bit weird like that. Some of the characters are more like caricatures. It's a strange thing with British films in general that there's this odd self-consciousness about them. And it's something that's reflected in British social structure. Many of the horror films I can think of feature the uh, super rich upper class or society figures rather than average people, and where working class folks are portrayed, it tends to be the likes of the strange locals. It's more than likely incidental, but this kind of commentary on those society leaders and those who do not conform is common and reflective on the British psyche in particular. It's a subsurface note that plays with our perception of the characters. There are a lot of ideas going on in terror, probably a few too many, and as with so many other examples of films with an awful lot going on, the ideas never really coagulate into something graspable. It throws out two vastly contrasting styles which feel very much like separate films. Tonally, it also clashes in the same way, though probably not as badly, certainly not to the extent of damaging the film too badly. It's uneven and choppy in these regards, but it is saved by the fact that the film feels like it's making a concerted effort to be both fun and interesting, which in many ways it is. Overall, though, it would be quite a stretch to call it masterful, but it is a pretty solid film that, despite its shortcomings, is directed by someone who knows how to deliver an intriguing atmosphere. It's ballsy, if a little borrowed in its style, and a magnificently accomplished film in many practical regards, particularly considering the budget. Norman J. Warren certainly puts a good deal of gusto into the film, but because it meanders around in style and point a bit too much, it can sometimes feel like it's lacking in pace. That said, it's not too ponderous, and when the action kicks in, it's well worth the wait, though it leans more towards style than substance, 
That style, well, it's a little borrowed and it doesn't quite stand up as being extraordinary. Terra is a decent, if somewhat muddled affair, certainly one to be taken for its quirkiness and atmosphere rather than its coherence. It's certainly worth checking out as an example of British exploitation, even if it is British with an Italian accent. Valentino, we're not shooting. Oh. What? Hi. 